Hi, I'm Olivia Mattis, representing the Souza Mendez Foundation. And today we're presenting a history that is very close to my heart. In fact, my own grandfather was in this film that you saw in preparation for today's program, the film Just a Link, the beautiful film Just a Link, produced by a Belgian organization called Le Film de la Mémoire. And we are so privileged to have the founder and producer of Le Film de la Mémoire. He's here with us from Belgium. His name is Willy Perlstein, and you will meet him in a little while. We also have our resident historian, Dr. Mordechai Paldiel, who was in fact born in Belgium, the country that we are talking about today. He was not in Belgium during the war period, thank God, but he does have that personal connection. And then most personal of all, I invited my own mother to be on today's program. My mother was a hidden child in Belgium. Her name is Dr. Noemi Mattis. She's a renowned psychologist in Salt Lake City, Utah. And she will be talking about a little bit about her own history, but more so about the story of her parents and what they did. So we're going to hear first from Dr. Paul Diel and then from Dr. Noemi Mattis, and then from Willie Perlstein. So Mordechai, Dr. Paldiel, please take the floor. Uh, thank you, Olivia. So I want to start by showing you first uh, the map of the country we'll be talking about, the map of Belgium. It's a very small country. It's surrounded on uh, three sides. On the north is the, the Netherlands, what we sometimes call Holland. Uh, to the east is uh, Germany, uh, to the south is France, and uh, to the southeast of uh, Belgium is a little country called Luxembourg. Now, all these countries around Belgium were under German control uh, when uh, this story begins. The Germans uh, had a very stiff control of the Netherlands, and they had a, what is called a military occupation of, uh, of France and Belgium. So this is a little country. The main the two main cities with the largest Jewish population were Brussels, you see that on the map, Bruxelles in French, uh, which is the capital of the country, uh, which is where the, the greatest part of Jews lived. And then the next uh, important Jewish town was Antwerp to the north. Okay, now uh, Belgium is divided into two distinct communities. Uh, to the south is a French speaking uh, Belgian community. And to the north is a Flemish, which is the, uh, very close to the Dutch language in Holland. So in Antwerp, they speak Flemish, and in Brussels, uh, a mixture of French and, Sp and Flemish, but mostly uh, French. This is the map of Belgium. You can see Jews living there who planned to escape. Uh, well, they had to escape through, they could only escape through German-controlled territory. Uh, they would try to escape to France and, and get to Switzerland if they could manage. Uh, on the top left side is England, the United Kingdom, but that means crossing it by the British, uh, by the Channel, by the English Channel, and that was a little bit dangerous. So that's Belgium from 1940. Germany invaded Belgium on May 10, 1940, and Belgium was lucky to be liberated earlier than many other countries. So here's the... Uh, Chronology. May 10, Germany invades Belgium. Okay. Uh, and then uh, in, in Antwerp, uh, which was uh, Flemish, and uh, there were uh, collaborationist movements in, uh, in Belgium, and one of them was in Antwerp. And they, uh, they, if there was only one pogrom throughout the occupation, uh, German occupation, it was a pogrom by, by some Flemish uh, organizations in Antwerp where they they torched two synagogues in Antwerp, but that's the only one. Generally, the Belgian population will try to help the Jews. They have a very good record. Uh, in 1941, the Germans created a sort of a Judenrat. It was called Associ uh, Association des Juifs de, Juifs de Belgique, AJB, and that's a Judenrat which, uh, through which the Gestapo passed on uh, all the orders and restrictions which they wanted to apply to the Jews. So 
the uh, in June 1942 came the obligatory wearing of the yellow star where every Jew age six and above uh, <laughs> stepping outside the home had to have a yellow star on coat and then uh, the next month uh, the start of the mass deportation from Belgium in July 42 uh, from uh, mostly Jews were collected and brought to a uh, transit camp between Antwerp and Brussels called Malin in French, Mechelen in Flemish, and from there they left for mostly to Auschwitz. Uh, that's in July. And in September 42, the Jewish Defense Committee, uh, Comité de Défense de Juifs, we'll call it CDJ, was created. And we'll talk more about this later. Uh, Belgium was liberated on September 4, 1944. September 4, 1944 was Brussels and uh, Antwerp, and then the rest of the country. So, and that was the liberation of Belgium. So the occupation of Belgium was uh, a little bit more than four years. The Jewish Defense Committee, Comité de Défense de Juif, uh, was created in September 42 as a Jewish clandestine organization specifically for the purpose of rescuing Jews by avoiding the deportations of the concentration camp. The, the CDJ decided to forego armed resistance and devote all its efforts to finding hiding, hiding places and provide false credentials and identification and ration cards for those in hiding or living in the open and find sheltering places for children. Its main base of operation was Brussels, which was also where most Jews lived, but it also had branches in Antwerp, Liège, and Charleroi. Those active with the CDJ who opted for armed resistance did so mostly on their own initiative. Uh, the CDJ came into being at the, at the instigation of several Jewish activists, mostly by uh, Gerd Jaspa, previously active in the Communist Party, and wife Yvonne, and Dr. Chaim Perlman and wife Fella. The CDJ included many other Jewish personalities, such as uh, Abush uh, Werner of the Zionist Poale Zion Left Movement and other Jewish organizations. A few words about Gerd Jaspa. He was a mining engineer who, before the war, was active in various leftist political uh, agendas and was one of the principal founding members. Arrested in June 1943, he was eventually deported to Buchenwald camp and luckily survived. Wife Yvonne, a pre war social worker, was active in locating places of refuge for children. As for Chaim Perelman, number four, he taught philosophy at the Brussels Free University. In September 1942, he agreed to use his home as the launching pad of the CDJ and the presence of other key Jewish figures, while at the same time prevailing upon Gerd Jospa that the new organization will be all inclusive and represent all shades of political opinions in the Jewish community and not necessarily only left-wing socialist and communist tendencies. As for wife uh, Fela Perlman, number five, she had a PhD degree in history from Brussels Free University. A child, Noemi, was born to the couple in 1936, and she will be the next speaker. When the Germans forbade Jewish children from attending public schools, Fela Perlman contacted Uckle Mayor Jean Herring to make possible the creation of a school for Jewish children. And it opened under the name of No Petit, in French, of little ones. Mayor Herring also arranged for a special tramway to take the children to and from school in broad daylight. Under the pseudonym of Denis Dumont, Bella Perlman met teachers willing to serve in the Nopeti school, and especially the non-Jewish Jean Daman, number seven, then a 21-year-old school teacher who became the school principal and Fella's right-hand person. This was all in 1941, before the start of deportation, and even before the creation of the CDJ. When the Germans closed the Nopeti school after only a few months, of operation, Fella and Jean de Man were busy finding sheltering places for children. After the war, Fella Perlman was instrumental in starting four orphanages for children 
whose parents had not survived. And then we have uh, Maurice Heiber, who headed the children's section at the CDJ with wife Esther helping out by distributing money to the sheltering families and institutions that needed them. The rescue of Jewish children aged up to 16 years included conveying children to their new homes and keeping tabs on how they were cared for, an undertaking that necess necessitated much travel. And this was a province of young women who served as godmothers. Uh, in French, we call them marraines. Uh, here you have a picture of some of these women who took the children to their hiding places. And in the Middle East, again, again, Maurice Hybert, you have uh, André Golan, and you have Ida Sterner but, uh, and the others who were involved in this very, very moving operation of sending children. They fetched the children, took them to their host families, and kept tabs on them. In this important rescue operation, help was afforded by Yvonne Nevjean, number 10, who headed the country's national children organization, ONE, in other words, Oeuvre Nationale de l'Enfance. Nevjean agreed to use organization's vast network to place children with families and in institutions meant to protect them. This is how it mostly worked. Parents were first approached by one of the trained child conveyors with the delicate task of persuading the parents to let go of their children. Now, one must remember that the natural familial instinct in times of danger is to close ranks within the family. Here, the shocked parents were asked to militate against this instinct and part with their children as the only means of saving them by surrendering them into the hand of strangers, mostly non-Jewish young women who presented themselves as social workers and without any indication of where the children were to be taken and how contact was to be maintained between both sides. The Jewish Ida Sterno, number 11, was one such child conveyor. Before the war, she worked as a social worker and then accepted just as offered to work in the rescue of Jewish children under the direction of Maurice Heiber and was assigned to find placement for the children. As part of her work, she led groups of 10 to 14 children to a tuberculosis sanatorium where they underwent a thorough medical examination. Sterner worked closely with the non-Jewish André Golen, number 12, a former teacher. Uh, here you see her walking on the street in Brussels, uh, and she probably has uh, false identities in her back, and behind her is just a German officer just walking on the street. Quite dangerous. Uh, so both Sterner and Golen kept records of all these hidden children in an apartment in Brussels that they shared. As told by Sterno after the war, I hid the list of the sheltered children with the names of their hosts under a rug in my apartment, an illegal residence that I shared with André Golan. Now, when children were in danger of being discovered at their hiding places, Jewish activists, some of them associated with the CDJ, took preventive action, such as took place at the Train Très Saint Sauveur convent, where 15 girls were hiding, placed there by the CDJ eight months before. Someone had informed the Gestapo about them. And before they could raid the place, a team of Jewish persons, some of them associated with the CDJ, forced themselves into the convent, snatched the girls, and rushed them to several other locations. And uh, some of these uh, persons, you can see there on the right-hand side of the, uh, of the slide. And uh, to uh, I will mention uh, their names, uh, Toby uh, Zimberknopf. And uh, the others, I don't see them here on the, on the slide, but you, can, but you can read their name. And so uh, finally, about statistics. There is no definite account of the number of Jews saved through the works of the CDJ. It saved in various ways, false credentials, food ration cards, movement from place to place, and of course, hiding places for both adults and children. Some 
place it as high as 12,000, including between three to 4,000 children. I repeat, 3,000 to 4,000 children. It's quite a big operation. After the war, 768 associates of the CDJ were formally honored by the Belgian government as civil resistance. Finally, the Jewish organization, the Bnei B'rith organization, honored some of the Jewish rescuers, including Chaim and Fela Perlman. I don't have photos from uh, Bnei B'rith on that, but I do have photos of the two non-Jewish rescuers, Jean Demont and André Gerlin, who were honored at Yad Vashem. And here you see uh, Jean Demont and uh, Professor Rosenkranz from Yad Vashem. Uh, Yad Vashem standing next uh, to her, and uh, and the other picture is of uh, André Gerlin and the Belgium ambassador, and I'm standing behind uh, behind André Gerlin. So I'm finished, and now it's uh, your turn to tell us your story. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mordechai. I was at first reluctant to participate in this program. I have already told my story to this audience four years ago, and it is available on YouTube. I didn't want to repeat it. But Olivia needed a presenter who had been a hidden child in Belgium, who was still alive, with most of their marbles, and could speak English. Other than me, she could not find anyone who checked all those boxes. I am the daughter of Fela and Chaim Perlman. As a founder of the Jewish Defense Committee, my father has received many honors. There is a street named after him, and the local authorities have affixed a plaque on the house where I grew up. Ici vécu le baron Chaim Perlman, philosophe, professeur à l'Université libre de Bruxelles. Il fit de cette demeure un haut lieu de résistance à l'oppression nazie. Here resided Baron Chaim Perlman, philosopher and professor at the Free University of Brussels. He made this home a major center of resistance to Nazi oppression. You notice that he is referred to as Baron Perlman. Indeed, at the end of his life, he was brought into the Belgian nobility, an amazing honor for a Jewish man born in Poland. The plaque and the street bear his name, not my mother's. Yet she was as much a leader of the resistance as he was. It was Fela who originated the program to hide the children. Fela was a remarkable woman raised in Poland she graduated from the famed Hebrew gymnasium in Lodz. At the time, only a small quota of Jews were admitted to the Polish elite universities. This is why she moved to Belgium to study at the Free University of Brussels. She completed a PhD in history in 1935, almost a century ago, as well as a degree in education. She spoke six languages. She exuded charm and was very, very funny. Indeed, after the war, she published a book about the resistance. It's a book of humorous short stories. My knowledge of the war years is through the eyes of a child. Aside from the funny stories, my mother never spoke to me about that time, never shared her grief. She had lost her parents, three siblings, most of her large family and many childhood friends. They all had remained in Poland and died at Auschwitz with the passive enabling of the Polish population. Unlike the countries of Eastern Europe, there was little anti-Semitism in Belgium especially not in Brussels and the French-speaking South. Therefore, the Nazis had to execute their evil deeds in slow motion. For example, they expected to have the local authorities distribute the yellow stars. Brussels is composed of 19 communes, each with a 
Burgmeister, something like a mayor. The Gestapo summoned all 19 to a meeting, explained what they were expected to do, and most were sheepishly ready to acquiesce. But Jean Herrings, the Burgmeister of Brücklo, knew that he would not obey. He had come to the meeting with a little suitcase, expecting to be arrested. He spoke up. I make no difference between the citizens of my commune, and I shall not do what you ask. It takes courage to publicly be a coward, so the other Burgmeisters were shamed into following Herring's lead, and all refused to comply. The Germans had to perform that task by themselves. For this and other courageous acts, Herring's was recognized by Yad Vashem. The Jews who were Belgian citizens were safe for a while, if they stayed clear of politics, which of course my parents did not. To keep me safe, my parents sent me to live with friends of theirs, the Forani family, who lived nearby. This was 1941, and I was probably the first hidden child. Now, I want to mention that this is the only picture of me through the entire war period, as we didn't take pictures at the time. I didn't stay for, with the Foranis for long. A visitor to their home was chatting with the children and asked me, do you come here often? And I replied, I live here, I'm a Jewish child in hiding. Well, my mother was told this cute story and immediately foresaw danger. And she moved me to another place, to the Blake's family. The Blake's home uh, was attached to my parents' home. Uh, fortunately, my parents' side was much larger. The Blake's were very, very poor. Emile Blake's was a wood craftsman. Think Gepetto in the Pinocchio story. He carved moldings for luxury homes. The Blake's home had no indoor plumbing except for a cold water spout in the kitchen. There were two bedrooms, one a small mansard where their son Philippe slept. Philippe gave up his room for me and slept in his parents' room. They never accepted compensation for their courage and generosity. Emile also hid confidential papers for the resistance. He has been honored by Yad Vashem. While at the Blakes, I saw my father getting arrested and being manhandled by a German soldier. This is an indelible, indelible memory. They also searched the Blake's home, but found nothing and paid no attention to me. But I was keenly aware of being a brown-eyed child in this blue-eyed family. Bella was not deterred by her husband's arrest. With her high heels and feathered hat, she went to the Gestapo headquarters. In flawless German, she demanded to see the commandant and was let into his office. Standing at the door, she said, there has been a terrible mistake. Soldiers came to our house and arrested my husband. I don't understand. My husband is a philosopher. He deals in abstract ideas. He has no interest in politics. She goes on in this vein. After a while, the commandant invites her to sit down, offers her a cigarette. He proposes a bargain. He says, we are looking for a man named Katz. You find Katz and we will release your husband. And Fella responds, you have the Gestapo, the SS, the Belgian police, and the great German army, and you cannot find this one guy? How do you expect me, just by myself, to find him? And he says, that's his John Muglick. That makes This makes sense, said the commandant. We will release your husband tomorrow. He calls a soldier to give this order. 
My mother recognizes him and says, this man addressed my husband with the familiar form, do. My husband is a university professor. You don't call him do. I want, to, I want him to apologize. The commandant stops her. No, you're going too far. Bella returns home. The phone is ringing. It is Katz. She tells him, I don't know you. I don't want to know you. Never call here again. My father was released the next day. This was 1942. My father had been dismissed by the Free University of Brussels under Nazi orders. And to their credit, the university continued to secretly pay him a salary. That same year, I was expelled from kindergarten. Most parents care for their children's welfare. Bella's caring extended to all the Jewish children. We all needed a school. In a few weeks, she created a school, No Petit, with the help of Jeanne Damont, as Dr. Pardiel has mentioned. Jeanne was a 20-year-old teacher from a small town. She did not know any Jews, but she felt compelled to act. She asked Armand and was referred to Fela. They worked closely together throughout the war, first at the school, and then to find places to hide the children. Jeanne was honored at Yad Vashem. After the war, she moved to the U.S., married Aldo Scaglioni, a professor of comparative literature at Berkeley, and she spent the rest of her years as a lecturer for the UJA. The school did not last long. It had to be closed after the Gestapo came to arrest some teachers. My mother spoke individually to all the other mothers. She said, I cannot tell you what to do, but I have placed my child in a different family, and I suggest that you do the same. If you don't know anyone who could take your child, we will help you. This was the beginning of the program to place the children. As the program grew larger, <clears throat> it was <clears throat> it was spun off, the CDG took over with the Jospas particularly while my mother and Jeanne turned their attention to other priorities. In addition to the children placed by the CDJ, many children for more prosperous families were saved by devoted nannies or housekeeper who took them to their villages. I was accepted in a private school under an assumed name. The school's founder, Amelia Ahmed arranged for me to move to the home of her best teacher, Lucie Monnier, and her mother, Louise. This is where I spent the last two years of the occupation. I have spoken to them before. They saved my life, also my sanity. They also were ordered by Yad Vashem, and Lucie has been my inspiration for much of my professional life. Interviewed in, 19, in October 1944, uh, soon after the liberation of Belgium, my father said, every Jew saved was saved by a Belgian. And for every Jew saved, there was at least one Belgian in danger. Many were caught and suffered for the help they gave yet they never stopped helping us. Most of the people I spoke about today were not part of the financial elite or the academic elite, but like Sousa Mendes, they belong to an elite of courage and character. Thank you. And Willie, this is your turn. Good afternoon from Belgium. Yeah, it's, it's almost evening here, but it's okay. Um, I was asked to speak more about our company because uh, the film, you have seen it, so I will not repeat the information you have in the film. Uh, just a link, it's not from our initiative, 
it comes from the relationship we had and we have with the Belgian French television at TBF. In fact, from 1990 to 1995, at TBF has produced programs telling the story of what happened during World War II in Belgium, 50 years after the events. So, uh, in fact, they did 77 hours of program that way, 77 programs, and the people who were in charge of those programs were in relationship with me in 1997, when we made a film from Auschwitz to Jerusalem, telling the stories of the hidden child. They re recovered from orphans who were recovered from convents particularly, back to the Jewish faith because they were converted, some of them in the Catholic faith, and their immigration in Palestine in 1947. Uh, and then a few years later, I was working with Yvon Sivnans, and Yvon Sivnans once when they calls me, you know, I have a problem. I launch a program about hidden, ch hidden children. Okay, so it's okay, already we produce programs. My sister pro pro produced some of programs for the Jewish programs in Belgium, Shema Israel. That's okay. Let me see what's happening. And he said to me, I have a problem. I don't have the money. I need you as an independent producer. I was already known for our abilities to invest, to, to produce film about World War II and particularly the Shoah. And then it began with uh, Just a Link. And uh, we produced the film. To be quite honest, we were very lucky because we got the money almost in the six months later on from the French community and to make the, co the combination with other fundings. Uh, it doesn't often, after, uh, it doesn't happen that way most of the time. It's quite difficult generally to finance the films. Uh, so that was the story how the film came up with me. And I, came, I became a friend naturally with André Guelen at that time. Uh, two information I would like to add to what the Mortochai said and Noemi. Uh, the CDG hired less than 3,000 Jews, orphans, a bit of less. But after the war, to help people who have saved children, they they would there were a lot of people who were coming to them. Uh, they put the names inside the, the the books you have seen in the film to that they can be able to receive the support of the Belgian government. It was not a aim to to say we have saved more than three thousand pe young people. No one was caring about, but really to help people who have saved people uh, orphans. And I know that story because my mother was in the books when she shouldn't be in it. But anyway, uh, the CDG was the largest operation of a child of the old world, world War II. And about antisemitism in Belgium, there was a lot of antisemitism in Belgium before the war, but it was more anti-Judaism. The idea that people, Jews should be treated not as Belgian citizens was a limit that could be admitted by most of the population. So an example was the Bishop of Liège, the south of Belgium. He, was, he had quite a lot of quotes, anti-Semitic quotes in his letters and documents before the war, but he helped to hide the, uh, I would say that, the, the rabbis of Liège in, in its home. So it happens that that their antisemitism was not mortal, and certainly not the way it should it, it happen, by example, not in Poland. It was not the same kind of violence, more uh, worldly. Now, modus operandi, modus operandi came from the relationship I had with RTBF, the idea to, because they made all those programs, they, they had made a big mistake they paid the fees only for one screening because of the archive, the cost of the archives. The cost of archives has always been a nightmare for producers like me. Uh, today, a normal cost for one minute or begin, one minute used is 3,000 euros, more than $3,300. And sometimes it's up to 6,000 US dollars. So it's quite expensive. It's difficult to find the money to finance that. And so often the producers pay the fees only for one year or for one broadcast. And so when Yvonne Sevenance, we were on the road in Israel 
uh, shooting for the from Auschwitz to Jerusalem, Ivan Sivnov spoke to me and said, I have a problem. We have all those programs, all this work. We were, we were working during seven years to 30 people, and we can show again the programs. So we enacted a new series of programs uh, telling the whole story of Belgium in eight programs. I couldn't finance it because it was too close from 95, but we kept the most important, which is modus operandi. And I wanted to show, to explain the, the way the German took over the Jewish population in Belgium. They took everything at the end, they send, in to, they send them to Auschwitz. And the film, in the film Modus Operandi, you don't see really Auschwitz, you see the doors of Auschwitz, but you don't know because you see the rails. Normally, you know that image of the in entrance of Auschwitz in the film, we show, in fact, Auschwitz, but people don't know it. But before that, to explain how it works, how it functions during the, the two years. And the, in the film, uh, Modus Operandi, we present all the train of deportations the 26 trains of deportation of the Jews and the train of, the train of deportation of the Roms, the, the, the Romanians, the Gitans. And uh, so that film is all between brackets in French or Navire Amiral. It's uh, the film that can we show often that people can see and understand what happened. And regularly I go into schools to not to, pre to present the film, but really to answer the question to the, the, the youngsters about the film, because I always explain that that film is only 17 pages of text. When the report of the Senate in Belgium about the, co the collaboration, about the responsibilities of the Belgian authorities in the deportation and situation of Belgians makes 1000 pages. So as a producer, I always know that we are opening doors. A film is just, we, we bring the information, the basic one, it's a kind of summary in images, but we have to know that is only opening things. There are a lot of books, a lot of documentation behind, and we have to know that we have to be humble, and that, that's our job. We are not making books of 1,000 pages. We don't give the whole information. We have to make choices. And that's important. So uh, we can go to the next step. Uh, it's Ashcan. Hello, you have to. I have to explain my background. I'm a lawyer and a tax lawyer, but I always been very, very interested in history, and I and I became producer at the Flefin de Memoir because or thanks depends on the point of view of my sister. My sister, which we produced the first film of my sister, Escape to the Rising Sun, telling the story of the 20,000 Jews who fled to Shanghai during World War II. But then I'm working in Belgium and Luxembourg. And one day, uh, the responsible of the Centre National d'Audiovisuel in Luxembourg uh, called me and said, Willie, I have something I have to show you. It's incredible. And I don't know how we can make a film about that. And so it was the story of Ashkan. Oh, what is Ashkan? Ashkan is the secret prison where all the Nazi leaders were held prisoners by the end of World War II, from 8 May 1945 to the beginning of December. So during three months, they were held prisoners in Ashkan, which is Mont dorf les bains in the south of Luxembourg. And to make that film, we worked with... Uh, it was an innovative way to make a film, I suppose, I think. And the film was already shown at the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival in 2018 and other Jewish film festivals a bit all over the world. But with that film, we created a theatrical play. So with the documents, we found that the Nara in America, 1,000 pages with all the testimonies, the reports of the Americans about the prisoners, we made a film. Now, what is what is the matter of reports? In fact, Ashkan was a place where they held prisoners, all those important people, to try to understand what was Nazi Germany. Because by the end of 45, American army, even the specialists in American army, didn't understand what was the Nazi regime. Only a few people could understand it. And so they were 
uh, it was a matter of intelligence. So that was the film Ashkan. And uh, he had made a lot of festival. I'm quite happy. He made the 20 years uh, also a special presentation for the International Holocaust uh, Era Remembrance Alliance. Yes. So Riots at War is the first film who gave a comprehensive understanding of what were the attitude of all the Riots families before the war and during the war. So it begins with the, the family, the Royal family in Italy and Mussolini. But we have, you have to see that film, it's two times 52 minutes, the attitude of the different royal family. How they behave well in certain countries, like UK or France, with except, one exception that everyone knows. Oh, it was problematic sometimes with Leopold III in Belgium. Oh, it was, it was really good about the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. So the attitude were related to the past of their own countries. So I'd stop here. Fantastic. Well, so right now, audience, I would advise you to continue putting your questions into the chat box, and we will get to as many of your questions as we can. I already see one question, which is how to see the film. Now, you should have received the link for today's program in the same email as a link for the film. And if you didn't, please reach out to us and we'll see how we can help you. Uh, they should have been in that same email that you received. So right now, let me tell you a little bit about what we have upcoming here at the Sousa Mendez Foundation. So we have one more program before Passover, and that is next Sunday. Next Sunday, we are showing this classic, beautiful film called The Courage to Care. It's a film from the 1980s that was narrated by the late Elie Wiesel. And the film takes you on a tour of many of the countries of Europe and uh, different stories of rescue during World War II. So that's the film you'll be seeing. And then the program focuses in on one story, one family story of one little girl saved in Poland. And we will have a member of that family interviewed by uh, Peter Hellman, who wrote the groundbreaking film, Brown, who wrote the groundbreaking book in the 1970s called Avenue of the Righteous. So that is a free program. And I encourage you to spread the word to all of your friends. Then coming up in May, our first program in May, on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, there is a program to do with the crypto Jews, the conversos, and particularly those who are coming back to Judaism after generations. These were descendants of families that were persecuted by the Inquisition and forced to practice Catholicism but many members of these families are rediscovering Judaism. And in particular, this woman who will be our featured guest, Jeannie Milgram, she has traced her unbroken maternal line back 22 generations, which is pretty remarkable. She was born in Havana, Cuba, to a practicing Catholic family. And she has proven that they've been Jewish for the last 22 generations and more. And um, she's now an Orthodox Jew, and she is a virtuoso genealogist, and you will not want to miss her appearance. So now we're going to see a little trailer about her story. I've been having an existential crisis my whole life with my religion. As I was growing up and as everything was happening, and my, my desire to go back to basics, to go back to the fundamental of the Catholic religion, when you get to the fundamental of the Catholic religion, where are you? You're in Judaism. This is where I need to be because I was never comfortable. And being a religious woman, girl, child, I needed to be somewhere closer to where I needed to be. I was a single woman. I was young, family drama. I had two children that were not converted. I really didn't have any friends. Uh, there's a saying in Yiddish 
which is Nishtain Nishtaert. It means not here and not there. Every time I visit my mom and dad, I bring a stone and I bring a flower. It's so who we are as people that return from so many generations that our souls come back. I really believe that at least my whole existence is between the stones and the flowers. Something was inside me, something was pushing me, something was just compelling me. I wasn't, didn't feel I was whole until I converted and came back to the Jewish people. But now I knew that I wouldn't be whole until I was able to prove that my family was Jewish. And I also knew that this was extremely difficult. I started to look in, in Spain and I saw all of the Inquisition records from my family. They had fled from Spain into Portugal and in Portugal they had been caught again and again and again and again. And at first sight I was able to identify 45 women on, and men and children and elderly on my maternal tree that had been burned. Spain and Portugal, in the little villages that are known to have had Jewish populations, there are symbols on the walls scratched in deeply called cruces de conversos or converso crosses. I found a mikvah, I found a synagogue, I found in one of the archives a document that documented how much tax had been paid on all the Jews that lived in Fermoselle. When I go to Fermoselle, I always have a feeling of a town that has stood still in time. And it is really a, a feeling of belonging and being home in a place that is strange to me, at least in this lifetime. Fermoselle has for so many centuries had people leaving, taking their things from place to place to look for a better world. I was looking at the crypto-Jewish phenomenon of the descendants working with an organization called Kulanu, which means all of us. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of people waking up to the possibility of having Jewish roots. So now let's get to your questions. So I'm going to throw out two questions at once, and I will let all three panelists answer both questions. So question number one has to do with anti-Semitism in Belgium, whether historically the Flemish population were more anti-Semitic than the French speaking, yes or no. And no. then the question, the second question is the royal family. What is the story of the royal family in Belgium? Did they flee to Britain as the Dutch did? So both of those questions, please. I can, can answer. The first, from my point of view, no, there was no more anti-Semitism on the Flemish part of the country. But you have more extreme right and nationalist a party, the VNV, but the, the Rex was very popular in the South. It was as much anti-Semitic than the than the, the VNV in the North. They had different attitudes about collaborations because of the influence of the party in the nationalist part. But from the point of view from the anti-Semitism, no. No, we cannot you cannot say that uh, in the North they were more anti-Semitic than in the South. There was a lot of anti-Semitism before 1939 in Belgium. But as I said, for most of that anti-Semitism was Catholic with anti-Judaism point of view, which used so far for a lot, for the vast majority of those uh, people, uh, to arm people was something not acceptable. What we didn't see in the North, in the, in the Eastern countries. So the, the influence of the, the point of view of the Catholic views was different. And that's why a lot, a lot of uh, orph orphans were hidden through the, the help of all the in all these different places, Catholic places, because they knew the value of life. 
Now King Leopold, no, the family, the royal family stayed in Belgium, and that was a, a key point uh, after the war of what we call the the Belgian uh, the, la question royale, the, the 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 royal question, because uh, a lot of in the beginning people were thankful to to the king to stay in Belgium. He wanted to be like his father. Uh, he used to be in a very conservative environment and quite anti-Semitic also. Uh, always, also, always uh, from a, a very Catholic point of view, eh? not the most, uh, not, but Belgian one. Uh, and by the end of the war, after the war, when uh, King Leopold was deported in Austria, when he was ready to be back, uh, in fact, the majorities of the parties didn't, didn't want him back because he met Hitler during the war, because he was silent for a lot of things. The Jewish question was not in the center of the royal question, in fact. But the fact that he married during the war, before, first in the, in the church and then in the municipality, that shows that he was not a prisoner like all the Belgian, the soldier prisoners in different camps. And that was unacceptable for the socialists, the liberals, the communists, and even the leaders of the Catholic party, but they couldn't say it. So I'd like, to add, something, I'd like to add something about his mother, Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth, uh, she stayed in Belgium and she helped a lot. The, including the Comité de Défense des Juifs and other people uh, to help them to find uh, places, including the children, like uh, the place in Jamwan, uh, to shelter the children and to help Jewish people to survive. There is one thing that is still debatable. When the Germans began to deport the children in 1942, she wrote a letter to Hitler and she asked to Hitler, please, don't deport the Jewish people who are already Belgium citizens. And Hitler responded, okay, it's a deal. I won't touch uh, the Jews who are Belgium citizens. But the trick there was that 90% of the Jews in Belgium were not Belgium citizens. So the Germans began by deporting the bulk of Bel Be Belgium Jews, who were not Belgium citizens, because they had very strict citizenship laws in Belgium at the time. And when they uh, were they satisfied that they had deported thousands and thousands and thousands of non-Belgium citizens, because most Jews in Belgium had arrived there before the war from Poland, from Romania, from various places, okay? You talked about the leaders like uh, Perlman and Fela, and this, they came from Poland. Uh, Gerd Jospa and Ida Sturman came from Romania and some other places there. Uh, so, and then uh, when they uh, had deported the bulk of uh, Belgium Jews, then they picked up Belgium Jews who were citizens. So, uh, but uh, uh, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth was very friendly, helped Jewish people. And in fact, she was honored by Yad Vashem too, as the righteous among the nations. That's the mother of Leopold. And let me just add that the Belgian cabinet uh, did reconstitute itself in England and that one of its members, Albert de Vleeschauer, who was the minister of colonies, was rescued, received a visa from our hero, Aristides de Souza Mendes. That's number one. Number two is that the royal children, who King Baudouin, so Leopold abdicated to his son, King Baudouin, who had a brother and a sister, the three royal children received visas from Aristides de Souza Mendes. And, and I, it, I want to just add another note. Belgium, the Belgian police refused to take part in the rounding up of Jews. Uh, what the Belgian in, huh? in the first in the first two raffles, the Belgian police, the police of Antwerp was in, in Antwerp they did, Pacific. but in the rest of the country. They were not, they were lukewarm, and in Brussels, they did not. And I mentioned that because in Holland, the Dutch police rounded up Jews, and in France, the French police, the gendarmes, they were very active in rounding up. Uh, for instance, the very famous Val yeah. d'Iver was done by the French police. So Belgium had a, a much better record. So I, I agree with Willie. 
I'm not saying that we're not collaborating. We collaborated everywhere in Europe. But uh, Belgium had a, a much better record than compared to other countries in both in Western Europe and, of course, in Eastern Europe. That's why the Jewish survival rate in Belgium is over, is like almost 60%. In other words, 60% of the Jews in Belgium did survive by going into hiding, most of them. So that's quite a good record. So and, there's, uh, a, there's a question about after the war, about the children. Now, children had been hidden in different circumstances, some in families, some in convents, some uh, lost their parents, others didn't. So, okay, so the, how did it happen after the war and in terms of whether these children uh, remained Jewish or didn't? So talk about that, please. So the, the, it, it's a difference. Jews were hidden in convents and monasteries. Some of them were baptized. And then uh, the, the heads of the convents and the monasteries they refused, uh, on, they were not inclined to release the children back to, uh, not to their parents. If, they, if their parents were alive, they, they released them. But if their parents were not alive, they were not inclined to release them uh, to Jewish organizations. But that's very, very interesting. You know what, what excuse that they gave? Most of the Jewish organizations, like the one that Gail Jospa belonged, were leftists uh, and still communists. And they wanted the children back in order to give them a very secular education and tell them that whether God exists or not, we don't know. And so these uh, children who, when they were under religious uh, uh, tutelage uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the monks and, and the priests said, we, we taught our children that there is a God and so on. And we don't want to turn them over uh, to uh, Jewish organizations that would tell them uh, that uh, there may not be a God and so on. And, and give them socialist uh, indoctrination. So there was a big fight. It went to court. It went to court. Uh, usually, if the parents came to claim the children, the children were turned over, okay? But if the parents were not alive, they didn't survive, and uh, distant families and organizations came, sometimes there was a fight that went into the courts, and we dealt with that at Yad Vashem, where people asked to honor some of those that saved them, but then refused to return them to their uh, their families, uh, whether such persons should be honored as righteous among the nations. So that was, uh, it was not only in Belgium, but it was in Holland, and it was in Poland, and uh, children were not always released. And then you have to understand another thing, and I'll finish with that. A child that was held by a family, and the family became so attached to the child, and the child was considered one of them. And then one day, one day, a stranger comes and says, this is my nephew, release him to me. And you don't want to release him to a total stranger. The child doesn't know that man because he has been for two or three years in a different home. And, and to release that child is like abandoning. The, the, the child doesn't understand that. He's not a Holocaust scholar. So, uh, so it, it, it was very traumatic. Uh, for for the host family as well as for the children. And it, it's a whole different story, yes. And it, yeah, a lot there's of things a lot. have been written on that. You want to add something to that, Willie? Yeah, excuse me, yes. Most of the children went back to the to the Jewish faith and back to the Jewish community. Uh, they are we have a, one thing my sister, we found we found a woman who when she was 45 years old, 50 years old, she discovered that she was Jew. And uh, she was well, well, not well treated by the family where they about her, but most of them came back. In our film from Auschwitz to Jerusalem, we tell the stories of a lot of those orphans who went back to Judith because they went in the convents to have them back. Uh, but one thing what you, about the family is the confrontation for ch small children who were living in a different family and didn't recognize the mother or the father. Yes, it happens. A few, a few times, and some families shared the educations of the children. Like the, you, you, we have a, a, a very known cineast in Belgium, Gerald Friedman, who was two years old when he was hidden, and so by the end of the war, he was too. He knew he didn't recognize the mother, so he, he the, the her mother and the the new mother, the the mother of war, they shared him during the weekend. So on Shabbat, every two weeks he went to, 
to the synagogue and uh, the week after he was on the in the church and he spent his news like that uh but there's something important with belgium is that after the war we had 18 which is quite a lot 18 orphanage for jewish children and belgium became a place where from all over europe they sent orphans to be taken in charge because the, the world Zion, the zionist organization found brussels and belgium as a place to to have those children back be, before to send them to israel to palestine in fact because it was before israel it was 46 47 and so those orphanage uh, exist till the end of the use of the of those children it uh, the, the last one closed in 1958 so it's on, uh, and uh, we have a film about the the, the one who was in charge of uh, the, the the last orphanage and the stories. It's Sigi Hirsch, uh, who is quite known in Belgium, uh, and uh, that's I, I close my my uh, I, I give time for the question and answers. I would like to add a word uh, first to the question of antisemitism. In my own life, I remember only once. Uh, being called some name uh, through through the war, before the war, after the war. So it wasn't really rampant, but I lived in Brussels and the milieu that we knew was mostly connected to uh, the university and people who were basically not deeply Catholic. Uh, for a second, about Queen Elizabeth, uh, she was the honorary <clears throat> patron of the Belgian friends of the Hebrew University and uh, uh, the uh, Institute of Archaeology at the Hebrew University was named for her. Uh, I met her very many times. Her uh, best friend was the cantor of the synagogue. Uh, so she was very much uh, friendly to the Jews, uh, much more, of course, than her son. Uh, and number three about the children, uh, there was a whole group of children who were orphaned and who had no place to go. And my mother actually is the one who organized orphanages for the Jewish children whose parents did not come for them. And there was a real conflict that, the, you know, the um, Mordechai has said that people of different persuasions got along quite well uh, during the war. Uh, but after the war, there was really a uh, split because uh, the leftists, the communists, would have preferred to leave the children in homes, not in the churches, but in the homes, if they had uh, the homes that they had been happy in. Uh, while the Zionists, like my mother, felt that we couldn't afford to lose one child, that the Nazis would win if uh, we uh, lost any of our Jewish children she wanted. Uh, all of the Jewish children to remain Jewish, and she arranged to send them to what was Palestine at the time. Um, and there were many, many the, the conflicts were really where the children had been with loving families or with their nannies or uh, with uh, housekeepers who kept them. So this was my two cents. <laughs> so let's turn now to final thoughts. So Willie, what would you like to say in closing to our audience today? Um, if you want to look, you have the address now to, to see and uh, all the things we have done about World War II. Uh, for the moment, we are producing a film about the Kristallnacht, uh, about the subject, and we have been contacted a few days ago. Uh, we'll see, we, I don't know what will happen to make a film about Ivan uh, 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 Nevjan, because Ivan Nevjan was really one of the most important woman, I would say, as a resistance in Belgium, because her act of resistance just doesn't stop to the to, to Jewish Defense Committee. She made a lot of other things. So we'll see if it's possible to make, because it's a bit late, and now we can tell that story. But anyway, we are, we are here. We are available. And most of our films are subtitled in English. We don't dub in them, because we prefer that people hear the right voice of the people speaking in our films. Good. All right, Mother, it's your turn for final thoughts. Yes. Life did not end with liberation. Here's the epilogue, and I return to 
saying a few words about my parents. I said that my memories were from the memory from the vantage point of a child. I'm now in the twilight of my life and I look back in astonishment because my parents were so young. My father was 10 days before his 20th birth, 28th birthday when the Belgium was invaded. He was only 32 at liberation. My mother was two years older. And two of my grandchildren are older than that. After the war, my father mm -hmm. returned to his academic pursuits. He had been writing his first book during the, during the occupation years. Uh, it's a very slim book because it has uh, no footnotes and no references, of course. It's called On Justice. But it made enough of a splash that my father was consulted by the American drafters of the International Declaration of Human Rights. And he was also consulted by Ben Gurion about the law of return. And he was uh, uh, claimed to be one of the 40 Chachamei Israel, the wise men of Israel. My mother continued her activism. She worked with the Mossad towards the establishment of the state of Israel. This was such a beautiful dream at the time. <laughs> uh, how sad the days are to date. Uh, my mother directed the Aliyabet, the clandestine emigration of refugees to Palestine from Brussels. And we talked about the children. Uh, my mother also was uh, the person who organized the orphanages and she uh, very, uh, she had the insight to hire as workers uh, young people who had returned for concentration camps so that all of them shared trauma and they could relate as a new family. Uh, truth be told, I sometimes resent to sharing my mother with the, with the entire Jewish people. Uh, she tr used triage to direct her attention to the most urgent needs. And thanks to Lucie and Louise Monnier, I was okay. So I rarely made it to the front of the line. Olivia and I attended the meeting of hidden children from Belgium in 2007. Many attendees remembered my mother. To our surprise, most of them had chosen caring professions, psychologists, social workers, physicians, especially pediatricians. Many of us had benefited from the selflessness of our rescuers, and we were paying it forward. Mordechai? Okay, uh, I want to tell a different story. On April 19, 1943, convoy number 20 left the Marlene Mechelen transit camp on its way to Auschwitz with 1,631 people on board. While still well inside Belgian territory, as it passed the city of Tirlemont, it was stopped by three people, led by George Lifschitz, known as Jura. He placed himself on the tracks and waved a red lantern, usually used by train workers to signal the locomotive conductor, and the train stopped. Armed with just one pistol, Lifschitz jumped on the locomotive and pointed the gun at the conductor, while his two companions, rushed to the wagons, forced the doors open, and quickly handed 50 Belgian francs to those who jumped out and told them to rush to the nearest town and catch a bus back to Brussels and go there in, in hiding. All this while under fire from the German guards who had momentarily been shocked by the sudden attack. There are different estimates of how many succeeded to get away. Some say 115, others many more, of the several hundred who jumped off the train. Some were shot, wounded, and others captured and retaken. In 1993, to celebrate the 50th anniversary 
of the stoppage of Convoy 20, a monument was placed near the train stoppage site in remembrance of that event and the other train that passed on the same road on the way to the extermination camps. The significance of this event is that it was the only recorded deportation train stoppage throughout German occupied Europe. And it was planned principally by just one person, by Georges Liefschitz, a lone 26 year old medical doctor who convinced two underground men to join him in this attempt, not by combat, but by trick and ruse. And they succeeded in freeing at least 100 persons, if not more. Now, if there had been more persons like George Neuer Lipschitz in Belgium and in many other countries under German occupation, surely thousands of lives could have been saved. Imagine what one determined person with a lot of imagination could do to try to save innocent people from certain death. How one person can make such a big difference. There were, of course, many Jews in various partisan organizations, but none tried to stop trains delivering hundreds of thousands of Jews to the gas chambers. What a shame. But let us at least thank the 768 CDJ associates honored after the war by the Belgian government, who together saved thousands of Jews, including thousands of children. That in itself is an achievement worthy of high praise. Thank you all, and wishing you all a happy Pesach. Tak yeah. And for me as well, thank you, Mordechai. Thank you, Willie. Thank you to my mother. Thank you to our wonderful, loyal, beautiful audience that comes week after week. I hope you will sign up for next week, which is a free program, and then Cinco de Mayo, the 5th of May, the program on the crypto Jews coming back to the Jewish faith. So um, that's going to be a really beautiful program, and you'll have information after today's program on how to sign up. So enjoy the rest of your day. Be well. Thank you all. Bye-bye.